discussed three-point amplitudes uh, last time. We had some interesting uh, just demonstration how strong uh, the Chekhov factorization is when applied on four-point amplitudes, but we haven't really developed so far any new method how to calculate amplitude, so that's what we will today. We will do it in the context of uh, gluon amplitude, so I will say a little bit about Young-Mills theory and amplitudes of gluons, but maybe rather quickly, because we are well behind my plan <laughs> at the moment. Uh, then uh, we will develop that uh, new method. It will be a recursive method. And, but this method doesn't apply just to gluons. It basically applies to all three-level amplitudes, which satisfy certain mild properties. Yeah, so, so I will, and then once we get uh, to it, we, I will discuss it. So, uh, so we are now restricting ourselves uh, to Young-Mills theory. And we will calculate amplitudes of gluons at three level. So of course, this is kind of a vanilla case. We can also consider quarks and also calculate amplitudes of that. But uh, in principle, it's possible to do. There are even some tricks. Uh, how to get it from supersymmetric amplitudes, uh, which I will not get to it. But uh, our goal here is to discuss, disc uh, discuss gluon amplitudes. So that was already mentioned several times. We also mentioned the Young-Mills theory. I also mentioned it briefly. So, uh, <coughs> so the amplitudes we are interested in are amplitudes of n gluons. As I said before, we consider everything incoming. Uh, we can always turn incoming into outgoing by flipping the sign of momentum and flipping the helicity of, of the particles. So these amplitudes will now depend on uh, the number of external x. And there will be, also, again, uh, there will be another important characterization of the amplitude, which will be, we call it k. And that's the number of negative helicity gluons. Yeah? So the gluons have some. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative, and k will denote the number of the ones which are negative. And then obviously n minus k is the number of positive helicity gluons. So this is the total number of particles. If we embed uh, the gluon amplitude into a superamplitude, which I will not have time to do it, I guess, uh, then uh, the k would correspond some r charge of uh, uh, of that super super amplitude. But for us, this is enough for us. So we have amplitude which depends on n and k. Now, if you look at the structure of uh, gluon amplitudes, for example, calculating using Feynman diagrams. Uh, so this is how the Feynman diagrams would look like. Uh, we would have this one. Uh, we would have also Feynman diagrams which have uh, four-point vertices. Uh, yeah. Many because uh, if you work it out, this is not what we will do. Yeah, I'm ju just, just saying, if you start with the Lagrangian, then there are two types of interaction vertices, three-point and four-point for gluons, yeah, which come from the covariant derivatives. Yeah, in abelian theories, you wouldn't have it, but in non-abelian, you do have it. OK, but uh, the, the Feynman rules, uh, let's say we look uh, at uh, uh, the diagrams which have uh, only three-point vertices. The same thing would apply for the others. Each vertex ha is uh, apart from some dependence on momenta and polarization vectors, also have a structure constant f, a, b, c. Yeah, remember last time, we also get these structure constants, basically from first principle. We were forced into them by this consistent factorizations of four-point amplitudes. But if you now look at it from the other point of view, from Lagrangian, they are already there. Yeah, so of course they must be there, but uh, <coughs> that's what also the Lagrangian contains. So we will have these structure constants in each vertex. 
So now if you evaluate everything, you consider on-shell amplitudes even fix these external helicities, write everything in terms of spinner helicity variables, you will also have these structure constants in the result, yeah, these Fs, and there will be products of Fs, yeah? Yeah, so the result will look like some products of Fs for general number of points. Here I'm kind of schematic, I didn't say what is n, doesn't matter, times some functions uh, which depends on uh, lambda lambda tilde plus some other product of f some times some other function, and so on. Yeah, so if we do the straight calculation, this is how it would look like, okay? Now, what is true uh, about uh, the, this is true for any graphs, not just tree, also loops. Yeah, we'll also have some product structure constants. Now this function will also depend on loop momentum, yeah. Uh, but uh, there is something special about uh, the tree graphs, yeah? So the way how uh, these indices of these Fs show up, yeah, you, uh, you sum over these internal indices related to these internal x, the way how they enter is uh, such that we can actually reorganize uh, the, the result and write the amplitude now, not using the Fs, but using uh, the traces of the generators of the group, yeah? Because we know these are the structure constants of the Lie algebra, but we can also turn them into, uh, into the, uh, they are related to the commutators of the generators. So it's a change of basis going from Fs to Ts, yeah? So instead of using F, A, B, C, we are using T, A. And then the result in this, uh, in this other basis nicely organized in a following way. We will have a sum over traces of uh, these generators, ordered traces, T A1, A2, A3, up to AN, multiplied by some amplitudes, also some functions which look like amplitudes, but here in these amplitudes, they don't have any group structure anymore. They are just purely kinematical, and the particles in these amplitudes are ordered. Yeah, so they are ordered like one, two, three, up to n. And we have to sum over all permutations, yeah, because here the particles are not ordered yeah, in the amplitude. So we sum over all permutations, but because of the, uh, of the properties of the trace, that the trace is cyclic, so if we just cycle TA1 at the end and TA2 at the end, the trace becomes the same. This will be also the property of this uh, amplitude. We only sum over all permutations modulo cyclic. Yeah. So. Now, Naively, this makes sense even. Yeah? Even if you look at these Feynman diagrams, if you look at the diagram, each diagram has some ordering of particles. Yeah, there is a question. Yeah, okay, very good question. The question if it is true only for tree-level amplitudes. Yes, it is. This is only true for trees. For loops, this will not happen. The reason why it's not happening is that you can still use the, uh, do the change of variables, uh, the change of the basis from Fs to Ts, but you don't get just the terms with a single trace, but also with products of traces. Each trace has some cyclic ordering, but different cyclic ordering. Yeah. So now you cannot, it doesn't make sense to talk about the ordering. And you will also see it in the diagrams. Yeah. So, uh, so this is just kind of a, schematic uh, uh, or just some visualization how this ordering is related to the ordering in the Feynman diagrams. So if I have a diagram, Feynman diagram like that, there is an obvious ordering of particles, one, two, three, four, five. And indeed, such a diagram would contribute to this amplitude with ordered particles. Actually, even at one loop, uh, if you consider the one loop Feynman diagram, there is an obvious ordering of particles. Yeah, in one loop, it's kind of an intermediate case because there is an ordering of particles, but if you do this transformation, there will be also terms with double traces where this uh, diagram would contribute. But just from the graph theory, starting at two loops, 
you can write diagrams which have no ordering. Yeah? And a uh, uh, simplest example of such a diagram is that, yeah, maybe I shouldn't write, draw these wavy lines to make it kind of more complicated, but okay. So this is a diagram at two loop, when if you label the legs one, two, three, four, they are not ordered. Yeah. The reason for that is that these diagrams you can draw on a disk, so there is an ordering at the boundary of the disk. This diagram you cannot draw on a disk, so there is no ordering of these legs. Yeah. Uh, any question about that? Does it make sense? Yeah. So at tree level, we can order, uh, uh, we can order these diagrams, but more on a technical level, we change uh, this basis and then we rewrite the amplitude in terms of a part which depends on uh, the group structure, as trace of t. There is a single trace at tree level which shows up only, multiplied by some kinematical function which we will call an ordered amplitude. Yeah, and it will have special properties, yeah. Uh, and then there is a story at, one, uh, at uh, one loop, two loop, and higher loops. At higher loops, this way of writing it, it's not possible. There are terms with multiple traces. But uh, in certain cases, it still makes sense to use an approximation when you only keep the single trace. So for people who heard about it before, this is a large end limit. Yeah, at tree level, there is directly a single trace once you consider loops. In the gauge theory, you can consider large and limit. There is some SUN gauge group. You can send n to infinity. And then only the single trace will, again, contribute. And basically, only the, the, the only diagrams that you would consider if you, if you wanted to write it in terms of Feynman diagrams would be the ones which are ordered, so not this one. This one will not contribute yeah, in the large and limit. But we are not doing loops here, we are just doing tree level, but this is just put it in the context, what this ordering means. This is non-planar diagram, yeah. So the large end limit is also called planar limit because only the planar diagrams would contribute, only. Well, it's, uh, I would say it oppositely. In the planar limit, only the ordered diagrams uh, contribute, yeah. So the amplitude is ordered in the planar limit, yeah. The full amplitude in gauge theories has also these terms. So in, in the language of these traces, it would have multiple traces. So there would be not a single ordering. But you can do a planar limit, large n limit, when you would only take the leading piece, and the leading piece in the large n expansion has a single trace, so you impose the ordering. So the only thing which would actually contribute are the things which are ordered in that ordering. Okay, but at tree level, it's an exact statement. Yeah? So at tree level, we, can, uh, uh, we don't have to do any limit. Yeah, the Fs enter the tree level diagram such that you can rewrite them as a single trace. There are no multiple traces which show up. And this way of organizing the full amplitude in terms of these ordered pieces is called uh, color ordering. And this is something I promised we to do by lecture three, and I failed to do it, but I'm doing it now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK. Yes. Ah, OK, no, well, this is just, uh, I'm not doing loops here. Yeah, I'm just saying that this thing with the ordering fails to work at loops, be because there are pieces which are not ordered. But you can still do certain limit of the amplitude, this large end limit, the planar limit, when you still have an ordering. But now it's not an exact result, but it's just a limit. Yeah. OK, very good. So. Uh, So this color ordering, it's an extremely useful kind of uh, bookkeeping for us because we, got, uh, we get rid of completely the color structure so we can forget it. Uh, we have only kinematics, yeah. We will calculate this function A, this ordered function. Once we have it, we would plug it here into this formula, sum over all permutations, and get the actual amplitude, yeah. But we only need to calculate this ordered function in order to get the full amplitude. So this ordered uh,
amplitude A, okay, and K. So now I add these two labels, one, two, three, up to N. This is the thing we would like to calculate. Now, because uh, the le external legs here are ordered, uh, the type of poles this amplitude has must respect this ordering. Yeah? So uh, when we, uh, uh, so this has only uh, certain poles. And this will be important for us because the method uh, that we will develop, these recursion relations, will be based on the knowledge of what the poles are and how the amplitude behaves on the poles. So, uh, for example, the factorization that we can get for some amplitude, so this is an example. So let's say we, we have some six-point amplitude, and on a pole, S1, 2, 3 equals zero, it will factorize into this four-point amplitude and this four-point amplitude. And this will be a valid pole because the particles here on the left side are ordered, and here they are also ordered. Yeah. If you consider another, some di other channel, it might be illegal. So for example, S124 equals zero is illegal because uh, it doesn't respect the ordering. Yeah, four is misplaced. There should be three next to two, not four. So this one is not there. Yeah? The full amplitude has all these channels, the AN, but disordered amplitude has just a small subset of them, which is good for us because uh, this is a simpler object than this one. But we build this one from these, from different term permutations. Any questions about that? So the only... Uh, Okay, maybe I keep this uh, formula there yet. Just erase this. So if one asks you what are all the possible poles of this ordered amplitude, it will correspond to all divisions of the labels on the left and right, such that it respects the ordering. Yeah. So some one, two, up to J. Or it doesn't have to be from one, actually. I plus one, J plus one, J plus two, up to I. Yeah, there is N somewhere here, but yeah, this, this just runs around. And uh, the... Uh, the pole corresponds to having uh, the sum or the square of the sum of these momenta being zero. Yeah? So the factorization happens for P square equals zero, where P is the sum of these momenta. But it must respect the ordering. that make sense? Any questions about that? Yes? No, they are not there. In this object, there are only these poles. Yeah, yeah. You take this object, this is not yet the full amplitude. Yeah, you strip off the color and you fix the ordering. In order to get the full amplitude, you take this object, you multiply by trace, sum over all permutations. But it is enough to calculate just this, to know the full thing. OK? So we will calculate this object. That already contains enough information. Yeah? And this object is simpler because it respects the ordering. So the only poles which, are, which appear are the ones which respect the ordering, which is a small subset of the total number of poles. OK? Any questions here? 
Okay, so uh, so what is the structure of our function that we would like to calculate? Uh, and now I will uh, use a uh, little bit shorter notation. I don't want to kind of list these labels. Uh, so I just use A and K, and this is really A and K for this, what is called canonical ordering. Yeah. One to N. The uh, any other ordering you just get by flipping the labels. Yeah, but it's enough just to calculate this. Okay, so what is the structure of this function a and k? So, just very trivially, once you sum all Feynman diagrams together, again, if you want to think about it as a sum of Feynman diagrams, you put them under common denominator, you get some huge rational function, which is a numerator, and has the denominator, and in the denominator, you get a product of all poles. And all the poles look like that, pj square, uh, where pj is a sum of momenta uh, yeah, from, from some label, let's say, j. Okay, maybe I should call, call it with a, okay, anyway, let me call it pj. Yeah, from some, it's typically labeled with two labels, i, j, starting from i and going around up to p, j. Okay, so let me, let me just say p, i, j square. So we know, uh, uh, so, so sorry, so there is no sum there. I, I explicitly wrote what they are. So we know in advance what the poles are. They must be these poles, yeah, what I showed there. We don't know what is the numerator. Yeah, that's just some result of a calculation. We don't know it. If we knew it, we knew the result. Yeah, we would be done. There would be nothing to calculate. But the important uh, uh, statement here is that we know the poles in advance. Yeah, all the poles correspond to these factorizations, where the labels run from i to j on one side. Yeah, and from j plus one up to i minus one on the other side. When the factorization channel is approached, when pij square, the sum of these momenta on one side, go on shell, because then this particle is on shell, this internal one, yeah, with momentum pij. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah, so the fact that we know the pole structure in advance without doing any calculation is very important. Yeah, here. But we know it just because we know how the amplitude factorizes. So the factorization enters crucially here, uh, uh, this story. Yes? Uh, there could be. We will. Uh, can, can you repeat? Yeah. Okay. Please? So, uh, so so far we haven't said how we construct the amplitude. Yeah. We will construct it from the poles, uh, from no, no knowing how the amplitude behaves on the poles. But in principle, there can be pieces which cannot be obtained by that. Then uh, the theory is not constructible. Yeah. From that. Uh, but this structure of the amplitude is for any theory. Yeah, so, okay, we are doing these gluons here, so I make here, this is more general statement that the amplitude, the tree-level amplitude looks like that. Yeah, we will do it in the context of gluons. But uh, the fact that after you sum everything and put it under common denominator, that the fact that it takes this form is just trivially true. Yeah, the question is, how can we reconstruct this? How can we fix n, basically, yeah, in this, uh, in this function? And we would like to do it from the, from the knowledge of how the amplitude behaves on poles. It works in young males. It works for many other theories. It doesn't work for general theories. There would be one mathematical uh, condition that needs to be satisfied in order that to be true. Yes?
also, everything is there. Yeah, everything is there. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, so, okay, so this is our function we would like to calculate. Now, this function, we can use the spinner helicity variables and will depend on lambda lambda tilde. Uh, we fix the external helicities. Now, before we do it, it's uh, good to kind of review di di this, what I say can be derived, but let me just here state it that uh, the, uh, the gluon amplitudes for fixed number of external uh, legs look quite differently depend on, depending on this k, depending on the number of positive and negative helicities. Yeah. So for example, if you have only positive helicities, yeah, so the amplitude would be basically like what? 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, up to n plus, everything is positive, then the amplitude is zero at tree level. The same thing is true if k equals 1. So you will have only, let's say, 1 is minus, but the rest is plus. This amplitude is also zero. Yeah. Actually, the best way how to see it is using supersymmetry. It's kind of strange, but if you embed it into supersymmetric theory, you immediately get that these amplitudes are zero, yeah. But uh, you can also prove it using the recursion, the way how we will calculate the non-zero amplitudes. And uh, uh, the first non-trivial amplitude is with uh, two negative gluons, and the rest are positive. And this is exactly what we will get also through our calculation, but this is the Park-Taylor formula that we showed in the first lecture. Yeah. So for example, 1 minus, 2 minus, 3 plus, up to n plus. This is this uh, famous Now note, okay, and then the other amplitudes are more complicated. Yeah, so only these three are simple, the first two being zero, this one having a one-line formula, and the others are just not one term. Yeah, they are more complicated. Now, from that, we can also flip all the pluses and minuses. Yeah, that's something I mentioned. If you flip plus and minus, you flip lambda and lambda tilde in the formulas. So obviously, if I have a formula for zero number of negative helicity gluons, I flip, this is zero, I flip lambda and lambda tilde here, I still get zero, right? So the amplitudes uh, with uh, uh, n minus one and n negative helicity gluons are also zero, yeah, by just parity. Similarly, I can also do it here, and I get a similar formula now for k equals n minus 2, which is just flipping uh, these brackets to the other type of brackets. Yeah. This formula is called Park-Taylor formula, but uh, there, is, there is kind of more physical names for it. Uh, this is also called maximally helicity violating amplitude, because uh, uh, so MHV, which is maximal helicity violating, because if you just consider incoming and outgo, yeah, it, it has maximal kind of disproportion between pluses and minuses, yeah, so. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the names that are used is that if we have, for example, k equals 3 amplitude, this is called NMHV next, n being next to maximal violating, helicity violating amplitude. k equals 4 is n square MHV next to next to, and so on. Yeah. 
well, I guess, yeah, we don't then use the ends anymore. We just say what is k, yeah. Uh, now, the, the amplitude with n minus 2, which is the parity conjugation of the MHV amplitude, is also called MHV bar amplitude. Anyway, so th this is just saying some, like, buzzwords, for my, which you might hear here. Okay, good. So that's about uh, this. And okay, in this notation, we can also put it in the context of our three point amplitudes. Yeah, so back to three point. So we had this amplitude uh, 1 minus 2 minus 3 plus. So here in this labeling nk, we would label it, label it 3, 2, because k, k is 2. There are two minuses. And this would be a 3-point MHV amplitude. And uh, the other one, 1 plus. 2 plus 3 minus would be A31, and we would call it MHV bar, 3 point MHV bar amplitude. Yeah, no, well, yeah, because this is a conjugation of this. Uh, it's al also the only k equals 1 amplitude which is non zero. So here I said that all the k equals 1 are zero if I have 1 minus or 1 plus. The only exception is 3 point, yeah, uh, when it's not 0. Yeah, all, the, all the others are 0. So for example, the only non-zero 4 point is the one when the number of minuses and pluses is both 2. Yeah. So for example, 1 minus, 2 minus, 3 plus, 4 plus. Yeah, so A42 is the only non-zero amplitude. Yeah, the, the, the exact assignments doesn't have to be like that. You can have another assignments of pluses and minuses, but only the K equals 2 amplitude, the MHV amplitude, is uh, non-zero. Yeah, because the others are K equals 0, 1, 3, and 4. They are all 0. Okay, so that's all with, uh, with this. Uh, any questions here before we move on? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it's work also very very similarly with supersymmetric one. Uh, with supersymmetric, you have uh, some conservation of uh, super momentum, yeah, some delta function, but it's very yeah. There is basically not this factor. Instead of that, uh, there is some. Uh, Super momentum delta function. Yeah, but we we are doing here. I don't want to <coughs> add supersymmetry here. It's possible, but it would it would need more time to introduce uh, certain things. We are doing everything non-supersymmetrically, just pure Young Mills theory, just pure Young Mills. Okay. So back uh, to. Uh, our uh, amplitude, uh, ordered amplitude. Is there any? Okay, no question. Okay, good. So we have uh, this amplitude a and k, and what do we know? Uh, I just repeat, uh, we know that uh, only poles. are p i j square is zero, where p i j is the sum of uh, momenta from i to j, from index i to index j ordered. And then the amplitude factorizes on this pole. So we have this picture. This is the Pij. 
which is on shell. Here summing from i to j. And here is j plus 1 up to i minus 1. And the amplitude factorizes, which means that it's a product of this amplitude. This is an on-shell uh, amplitude lower point with n1 and k1. And this one is also an on-shell amplitude with n2 and k2 in our labeling. It's also ordered, but it has this extra leg, which is on-shell. Yeah, so this is a physical on-shell amplitude, the same as the amplitude we would like to calculate for a smaller number of particles, but it has this uh, internal on-shell leg. But this bigger amplitude factorizes into a product of these lower amplitudes on the pole. So in general, it's not uh, 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 just a one term, but it's a sum. And uh, we have to sum over the internal helicity of this particle Pij, because that is not fixed. It can be plus minus or minus plus. Yeah, it can kind of be pointing in that direction or that direction. Yeah. So we, in general, we sum over it that for fixed external helicities. Any questions here? So these will be our two ingredients. Yeah. So we don't know this amplitude. We would like to calculate it. But we know something about its poles. We know where the poles are located and how does the amplitude behave on these poles. Yeah. So uh, we know the poles and we all know the residues on these poles. And we would like to use this information to reconstruct this back. Yeah? So you already can see that it will be a recursive procedure, because you assume that you know these amplitudes. But these amplitudes are necessarily lower point. Yeah? So if this is 6, this is, for example, 4 and 4, or 5 and 3. It's always lower point. So knowing the lower point through the procedure that we will introduce allows you then to construct the higher point. Yes. Stripped. Color ordered lower point. Everything is stripped. Yeah, these things are ordered. Okay, very good. Now you can imagine just try to do it uh, directly, but there is one problem with uh, amplitudes. They are functions of many variables. Yeah, the moment there are many variables because the momenta have components. They are on shell, so, and you have momentum conservation, which reduces it a little bit, but it's a function of many variables. And uh, that makes it a little complicated. So we would like to make our life easier and think about amplitude as a function of a single variable, because then we can use some uh, interesting theorems from complex analysis and, uh, yeah, and do this reconstruction more easily. So we would like one variable. Not, not these many variables, uh, uh, but just one variable. And think about the amplitude as a function of one variable. So the key idea is to do, so OK, so here we will now discuss BCFW recursion relations. So BCFW. Stand for Brito, Cacciazzo, Frank, and uh, Witten. So the key idea is to do a momentum shift. So I will first write the shift in terms of momenta, and then in terms of uh, lambda, lambda, tilde, the spinner helicity variables, because that's the way how we will do it. But the main idea works even just in the original momentum space. Yeah. So the idea is that you pick two momenta, let's say P1 and P2, and shift them. So P1 goes to P1 plus Z, Q. So I put the space-time index such that it's clear this is, a, uh, this is another uh, form momentum. And P2 goes to P2 
minus ZQ. So from this is clear that if the original momenta satisfy, and the others are unshifted, just two are shifted. It is from this uh, choice is clear that if the original momenta satisfied momentum conservation, these shifted ones will also satisfy momentum conservation. Yeah, because I shifted this plus ZQ and the other one minus ZQ. So this cancels out. Okay, unfortunately the, unsh the shifted momenta are not on shell in general. So we have to make them on shell. We have to impose a condition to make these momenta, which we can denote P1 hat mu and P2 hat mu to be on shell. And that puts some constraints. For example, it tells us that Q square is zero. The Q dot P1 is zero. And Q dot P2 is zero. Okay, in fact, these three conditions completely fix Q. Q has three de uh, four degrees of freedom, but it's rescaled by Z. So it really has only three degrees of freedom. Yeah, because we can always rescale it and absorb it in the Z, where Z is some complex parameter. Yeah? So this Z is a complex parameter. So this fixes uh, Q completely. It will be very nicely fixed in these spinner helicity variables, what we will do later. But let me just give the main argument just in, in terms of original momenta. Okay, very good. So we have this shifted uh, kinematics, and uh, we have a shifted amplitude, yeah? We just had this ordered amplitude, uh, one to n. We picked uh, two momenta, say one and two. This as you will see a little bit later, this is a convenient choice. Not necessarily one and two, but the adjacent labels. And uh, now I consider the shifted amplitude. So the shifted amplitude A and Z is the original amplitude that I want like to calculate. Now, K is not important for this discussion, so let me just drop it from here, but we will then have it once we do the explicit calculation. But it is for shifted momenta one and two. Okay? The helicities stay unchanged. Yeah, just the momenta are shifted. If you do it supersymmetrically, you have to also uh, shift uh, the Grassmann variables, which... Uh, <coughs> for these particles one and two, but we don't do it supersymmetrically. Okay, and I think about this as a function of a single complex variable. Yeah, I think about P1 up to Pn as being fixed, so they are just fixed uh, momenta, and I'm going to play with this parameter z. Yeah, so this is a function of one complex variable. But I knew already how the unshifted amplitude looked like. It has this numerator and denominator. Yeah? I didn't know how the numerator looked like, but I knew all the factors in the denominator. But I shifted momenta, and I know this also, the structure in the denominator. Yeah? So now this uh, shifted amplitude will be some polynomial in Z in numerator. And in the denominator, it will be product of poles in Z. So I will just write it schematically here. It will have single poles in Z. Then we will do it using the spinner helicity. We explicitly say what is ZK and so on. Yeah. But this is, just a, this is just a schematic argument. Yeah. AN as a function of Z has some numerator, which is some polynomial in Z, and has some denominator, which is a product of single simple poles in Z, okay? But these simple poles in Z correspond to
to these poles p i j i j square equals zero. But now, when the momentum here is shifted based on this shift, so it becomes p i j z square. Okay, so these poles originate from these poles, which were these poles before we shifted that. Yeah? These poles become function of z. You can actually see, we will see that they become linear function of z. This pi there is square, but kind of the quadratic piece will cancel. And they become these poles here in our schematic expression. But we know that the amplitude factorizes on these poles. Okay? So we also know how this function behaves on the poles in Z. Yeah? So we know residues of uh, A and Z on poles Z equals ZK. So we have a function of one variable. We know all the poles, and we know how the function, uh, what are the residues of this function on the poles. So we can use Cauchy formula from complex analysis in the following form. dz over z, so we take a counter integral of this function a and z. Yes. Yes, they correspond to it. We will exp cal explicitly calculate them. But they come from that. They, uh, these, we started with these poles. The poles are shifted with z. They become linear functions of z. And the residues of this function on these poles would correspond to factorizations of amplitudes. Yeah. We have some shifted kinematics, so there will be some details that we will work out. Yeah. But I'm just giving the main argument first, yeah, so that it's clear where it's going. Yeah. So we use this formula. So if you have a uh, meromorphic function uh, in a complex plane, in Z, and the function now vanishes at infinity. So that will be an input here. Yeah? So this function must vanish when z goes to infinity. Yeah, so this is input. And this is true statement for young males, for GR, for many other theories. Yeah? If it is not true, we need to know what is that pole at infinity to use that argument. Yeah? which we don't in general. So uh, if it is not true, we can do some modification, use some different recursion relations. But uh, yeah, but uh, the absence of poles at infinity is important. If it is true, then the sum of all residues of this function is 0. Yeah, that's the statement about the Cauchy's formula. You close the counter, and the sum of all residues is 0. Now, I put here dz over z. That was for purpose, because I added one more pole. Yeah? So this function has these poles at z equals zk, and we know the residues. This is a new pole I added at z equals 0. But what is this function at z equals 0? It's the original unshifted amplitude that I want to calculate. So I would like to use this formula to calculate this function at z equals 0 from all the other poles. Yeah? So, uh, so this turns into a following formula. So it's a a n at 0, which is the original amplitude, plus the sum of all other residues of this function, so the residues of a and z for z equals zk, is equal to 0. And we said that these residues correspond to factorizations of the amplitude into two subamplitudes, which we, uh, that's the input, yeah. We, uh, we know it already. So we know this term, and we calculate this term as a sum of these terms that we know. So that's the main logic of these recursion relations. Yeah, so we calculate this.
Okay, so any questions about the strategy here? Yeah? Ah, uh, yeah, so typically theories with derivatives, uh, like t effective field theories, yeah? Uh, basically, there is a, okay, maybe I can just say it here, there was a question about uh, young males and the contact term. You can now object, uh, because uh, really the essence, this is a technical part of the uh, kind of uh, the technical implementation of an idea that the amplitude is fully fixed from factorizations. Yeah, because that's basically a statement of this Cauchy's formula. Once you know how the amplitude behaves on all poles, and once you know all factorizations, this is enough to reconstruct the amplitude. You don't need to know anything else. So this assumes that there, are, there don't exist terms which have no poles that you can add to the amplitude. If you can add a term which has no pole, Obviously, the, all the residues are zero of that term, and you cannot fix it. Now, naively, this is true even for young mills and even more for gravity, because naively, even for four-point young mills, written in terms of Feynman diagrams, you have uh, kind of ST and U pole of, yeah. You have these Feynman diagrams, and then you have a four-point contact term. So the Feynman rules for that will definitely, the propagator will generate poles here and here. Yeah. Actually, in the ordered amplitude, you have only S and T pole. You don't have the U pole. Uh, but there is also this contactor, which has no pole. So now it looks suspicious. I said that the amplitude is reconstructed from poles, but the poles only uh, are in these two terms. And this has no pole, so naively I cannot reconstruct the amplitude. But here the power of gauge invariance enters. None of these Feynman diagrams is gauge invariant. Yeah. So, and if you already fix these two terms, they are not gauge invariant. You need to add this term, not to, not to match any pole, but to establish the gauge invariance of that. Yeah. So, uh, so it's the factorization plus gauge invariance. However, in these recursion relations, we will not see it because gauge invariance is already there from the beginning because we will talk about on-shell amplitudes which are automatically gauge invariant. Feynman diagrams are not gauge invariant. So that, that, that's the problem, yeah. And with gravity, it is the same and it's even worse because you have infinite number of contact terms. So you can say, well, there are all these contact terms which don't have any poles, how can you fix them? In that case, it's the diffeomorphism invariance, yeah, like the spin two version of the gauge invariance which fixes them. Yeah, so this one is fixed by gauge invariance. So in other words, you can say that the level of kinematical functions, you cannot add to young mills amplitude any kinematical function which is gauge invariant and has no pole. That such a function doesn't exist. You can add this thing, but this is not gauge invariant, yeah? So, uh, okay. Uh, any questions before we continue? And now, actually, question? Ah, there was a question. So, now, if you have higher dimensional terms, that might be a problem, because if you have, for example, f to the 4 term, that itself uh, would be gauge invariant, yeah, as a contact term. Yeah, so, of course, like, there is some conservation of complexity, yeah? So, for example, if you have f square plus uh, cf cube plus df4 and so on, and you add these terms, obviously, uh, you cannot reconstruct these terms from lower point amplitudes because they are just new terms, yeah? So then it's not reconstructable. If you, have, if you add finite number of them, let's say that, yeah, I don't know, you added certain number and then you stopped, then you have to provide the information about amplitudes up to that order when it stops. And then since then it is reconstructable, yeah? 
But you cannot do everything from three point if you added a new term at four and six or any number of points. Yeah. So there is some conservation of complexity. Yeah, you have basically have to, you need to give the recursion relations enough information, which is also in the Lagrangian. But in the Lagrangian, the, the three point and four point term kind of come separately. Despite they are related, of course, they come from the same Lagrangian. The same thing in gravity. Yeah? The R has infinite expansion, but all the higher points, four, five, six, up to n, are all fixed from the free point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it would be similar for gravity. Yeah? You have higher ones. If each of them generates infinite number of them. Yeah. Yeah, but it would be just finite number of them. You basically have to give the information about all these coupling constants. Yeah. And then the rest is fixed. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. the infinite tower is fixed. Yeah, in gravity, it's just kind of, uh, uh, it's, uh, there is just very crystal clear the difference between the invariant information that you need to give, which is just the three point vertex, and uh, the number of vertices that the, that the Feynman expansion actually generates, which is infinite. Yeah, but they are all fixed with, from the free, free point. Okay, good. So, um, so let's now, okay, so we are going back to BCFW. Now, I said that we have to shift to legs. So, um, so the solution to these constraints in terms of the momenta that we needed to find this Q, it is nicely written in terms of these spinner helicity variables. So uh, we shift separately lambda and lambda tilde. So we decide to shift lambda of one of the particles, let's say one, and it will be lambda one minus z times lambda two. The two is the other particle we are shifting. So this we will call lambda one hat. And then we will shift lambda two tilde as lambda 2 tilde plus z lambda 1 tilde. So this is lambda 2 tilde hat. So we are shifting one lambda and one lambda tilde. Yeah, this of course shifts p1 and p2, but in a particular way. Now, we can see that the momentum is still conserved because lambda 1 hat times lambda 1 tilde plus lambda 2 times lambda 2 tilde hat. If we rewrite it, yeah. Now I'm dropping the indices and the sigmas. Yeah, we are, I'm dropping that, so we are writing it like that. It's now lambda 1 minus z lambda 2, lambda 2 tilde plus lambda 2 times lambda 2 tilde plus z lambda 1 tilde. Ah, sorry, this is uh, lambda, one t lambda 1 tilde here. Okay. So you can see that uh, the shift piece is lambda 2, lambda 1 tilde, and it cancels between these two terms. This is the Q. The Q is lambda 2, lambda 1 tilde. Yeah, here. So this is equal to lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde, plus lambda 2, lambda 2 tilde. So momentum is conserved. Yeah, and in this, uh, here we out directly got uh, this Q that I was discussing before. Uh, now just a small comment, uh, the Q built, the momentum built from lambda and lambda tilde of two different particles is in general complex. So this is a complex momentum. Yeah. Uh, that's important because, yeah, anyway, if it was real, this was, it wouldn't be possible, yeah, if you just say. Uh, okay, so this is the shift that we do in, the, in these spinner helicity variables. Okay, so our uh, amplitude a and z 
is an amplitude which depends on uh, lambda 1 hat, lambda 1 tilde, unshifted, lambda 2, unshifted, lambda 2 hat, uh, lambda 2 tilde hat, shifted, and then on everything else, lambda 3, lambda 3 tilde, dot, 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 up to lambda n, lambda n tilde, they are all unshifted. Yeah? We are just shifting two objects, this one and this one. So now let's look at uh, the factorization channels. Yeah. So the amplitude has uh, many factorization channels, but uh, using this convenient shift, only some of them show up as poles in Z. So what do we need to go do in order the shifted kinematical invariant to depend on Z? So if one on, it was on one side and two was on the other side, yeah, and then there are three up to, let's say, some J, and there was J plus one up to N, and there was one here. These two guys are shifted. So the momentum here will be also shifted, yeah, because it will depend on Z. So this will depend on Z. Yeah, so the momentum here will depend on Z. And PZ square equals zero will give a pole in Z. If one and two were on the same side of the factorization channel, let's say one was here and two was here, then this momentum here this P is not shifted because the shift's canceled here. Yeah, and it doesn't depend on Z. So it will not show up as a pole in Z. Yeah? So no dependence on Z. So the only poles which are relevant, only factorizations, factorization channels which are relevant are these ones. One leg is on one side, the shifted one. The other one is on the other side. Now, you can already see why it's convenient to shift adjacent legs, because that minimizes the number of uh, factorization channels we need to consider. Yeah. If, one and, if these two shifted legs were far from each other, there would be more channels. Yeah. There would be more configurations that we can do. And we would like to make our, our, our life easier always. Yeah. So making the life easier is important. So we make good choices. Uh, we are lazy and don't want to do unnecessary work. Okay. Okay, so, so here there is a slightly boring part, which is a technical implementation, basically turning... Uh, uh, the poles in P into the poles in Z. Yeah, so we have to do a little bit of work, but it's not much work. So, okay. So, uh, <coughs> so we have this channel, one, two, up to J. J plus 1 up to N. So let's look at this, uh, this piece, uh, so on this part. So we have this momentum 2 to J, where 2 is shifted. So this is P2 hat plus P3 dot, 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 up to PJ square. So we just rewrite this shifted momentum P2. So the shifted momentum P2, all right, well, to write it, is uh, lambda 2, lambda 2 tilde hat, which is lambda 2, lambda 2 tilde, plus Z lambda 1 tilde. So this is the original P2 
plus z lambda 2 lambda 1 tilde. Okay, so we just plug it here. So this is p2 plus p3 dot 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 up to pj and this shift and this extra piece. z lambda 2 lambda 1 tilde square. So we just treat this as one momentum and this shifted part as the other. So if we square it, we get the original P2 uh, J square yeah, from 2 to J. This is a sum of these momenta. Then we get a term linear in Z, which is taking this momentum P2 J and dot it from one side with two and from the other side with lambda uh, one tilde. So this can be written using this mixed bracket I introduced before. as two, three plus four, dot, 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 up to j, one. And in principle, there can be also a term which is quadratic in z, but that one cancels because this is the q, and we square it, that's q square, and that is zero. Because if you, do, if you calculate the bracket 2, 2, that is 0. And 1, 1 is also 0. So there is no quadratic term. So this is a linear equation. Yeah? So this is 0. So we can just solve for z from that. Yeah, and I'm running out of time. Okay, so the so the pole corresponding to this factorization channel is z is minus p two j square divided by two three plus four dot 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 up to j one. You can also denote all this whole thing as p two j. This is a momentum. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you add momentum two here or not because once you dot it with two, it's zero. Yeah. Okay, so this is a position of the pole. Yeah, so this is a position of pole in this z space. And now all factorization channels look like this, just for different j's. Yeah, so the j runs from 3, 4, up to uh, n minus 1. Huh? P3j. So say it again, P2j. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just saying you can add 2 here. Yeah, and it's the same because then it's dotted with two. Okay, so we solved all the problem with the positions of the poles. Yeah, because let's call this pole Z J, and and uh, there are exactly this is n minus three of them for uh, all values of J. So these are positions of the pole. Okay. Uh, so in this formula, A and Z is uh, Z minus ZJ. Sorry, I'm not very uh, consistent with the labels denoting something J, K, and I, and so on. We know all these positions of the pole now. Okay, um, yeah, I would really like to write the final formula, so it will take five minutes, yeah. And I will leave some exercise, so there will be uh, just fill out some details for you, for people who are interested. So did this we now know? So now the argument uh, 
we are going back to the argument of factorization. So the argument of factorization was that uh, the endpoint amplitude on the pole, where, where let's say the P2J square is zero, factorizes into an amplitude which has uh, legs uh, two, three, up to J, and then some internal leg P, and the amplitude which has legs minus P, and then on the other side, J plus one, J plus two, up to N and one. Okay, this is unshifted statement. Yeah, this is statement about the power. Now, we have this amplitude A and Z. Now, it has this, the same pole, but it's now shifted. P to J hat square is zero. On this pole, the amplitude again factorizes into the same amplitude. The only thing is that things are now shifted. Two is shifted. By momentum conservation, the P is also shifted, yeah? And the other amplitude has minus P shifted. All the other legs are not shifted. N is not shifted, one is shifted. Why we can do it, yeah? So we started with this amplitude, which was on shell, and it had this factorization property. This amplitude is also on shell. That was also the reason why we chose these special shifts. It's all, all again on shell, so it doesn't matter that it is shifted. It satisfies the same factorization as the unshifted one. Yeah? The only thing is that these legs are now shifted. Yeah? Yeah, on this factorization channel, shifting one and two, the shift parameter kind of goes through this, di this factorization diagram. So this P is also shifted. Therefore, I put hat on P. But these amplitudes we know in this recursion ar argument. Yeah, because they are lower point amplitudes. So now we know everything. We know the positions of poles, and we know how the amplitude factorizes on these poles. So we just have to plug it into this cautious formula. Yeah. The only thing we have to be careful about is are some Jacobians of change of variables. Yeah. Because this is a pole in Z, this is a pole in P square, they are related or they are the same. There is some small Jacobian. So these are the details that you have to work out. But uh, yeah, they are just uh, small technical details. So once you work it out, uh, we get the final answer. So I again repeat the cautious. Uh, uh, Cauchy's formula, also sometimes called uh, global residue theorem. So the Cauchy told us that the amplitude an was equal to minus the sum over our residues. So we are summing over these j residue of the function a n uh, z on the pole z equal z j. And remember, there was a 1 over, in the Cauchy's formula, there was a 1 over z. A n z is 0. So, okay, so let me, yeah, it was a n 0. This was the pole on the z equals 0. So the other poles. There is a factor 1 over zj, yeah, as well. Uh, so it's 1 over zj. Yeah, you have to kind of do the function where in which you take residues is a and z over z. Yeah, so this is divided by z. So there will be, this is, like, this is what I was talking about. There are some small Jacobian factors that you have to be slightly careful about. But the nice thing is that once you change these variables from the p square into z, actually the Jacobians cancel. <laughs> And uh, the final result is following. It's minus a sum over j 
of uh, the amplitude, I call it AL, on the left side of the factorization channel, evaluate it at ZJ, AR, evaluate it at ZJ, divide it by P is 2J square. Okay? So, let's repeat the argument here. We have this amplitude which depends on extra parameter Z. We are going on a factorization channel. If it was unshifted, we have to go to special kinematics. Yeah, we have to adjust our momenta to sit on a factorization channel. However, instead of adjusting momenta, we are solving for Z. Yeah? So we are going to special Z. All the momenta stay generic. So for the special Z, the amplitude now factorizes in these two. Yeah? But now these momenta are shifted. And they take the value Zj in that case. Z equals Zj. Yeah? But there is an important difference. This formula is unshifted amplitude. Going on factorization channel imposes a constraint, and it's going to special kinematics. The fact that we added this parameter, we kind of added one degree of freedom, and now we are losing it back. And that one degree of freedom is used to go on a factorization channel, but not of an original amplitude, but of a shifted amplitude. Yeah? So therefore, the amplitudes which are here are evaluated on this Zj. Yeah? So they are for generic kinematics. OK, so this is the final formula. Uh, we will apply it for gluons next time. So there will be also some selection rules of, I, I said that you have to sum over this internal helicity. Some of the assignments might be allowed. Some of them are not allowed, and you get 0 for that. So we will have some discussion of that uh, and give examples. But this is a general formula. Yeah? And it works recursively. Yeah? So you start from three-point amplitude, you calculate four-point. So for four-point amplitude, the only terms that it can factor, factorize into is three and three. So you have three and four. Now you go to five-point amplitude. The only factorization channels are three and four. You calculate five-point. You go to six point. The factorization channels are five and three and four and four. You all know already those, and then you continue. Yeah? So it's a, a very different. Uh, okay. And these objects are amplitudes, the ingredients. So they are gauge invariant and on shell. So that's the main difference from Feynman diagrams. Of course, there is an efficiency argument. This is much faster, much fewer terms. But there is also a principal argument that these objects are on shell and gauge invariant. They will suffer from something else. They will have spurious poles, unlike Feynman diagrams, which have only physical poles. You always have to give up something. Yeah? If you want to expand the amplitude in terms of some object, you have to lose some property of the amplitude. It's never possible to preserve all properties at the same time. Uh, but these objects are on-shell and gauge invariant. And it's recursive, yeah? So in Feynman diagrams, with some small caveat that there is some smart version how to do Feynman diagrams called berens giler recursion relations. But in general, if you do Feynman diagrams, if I, give, if I ask you to calculate 20-point amplitude, you have to do it from scratch, yeah? The fact that you know all amplitudes up to 9-point doesn't help you much. Here, it's just one extra strap in the recursion. With this caveat that there are some, some smart people found a way how to organize the Feynman diagrams also in a recursive way. Uh, but in principle, they are not, while this is recursive. OK, so I end here. Sorry for being over time today. Okay. <laughs> Any quick questions? Quick question. Or urgent questions. For the Ah. See, I, 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 don't, I don't get the advantage of shifting coordinates. Do you, are you looking for more than MHV? Like you're shifting uh, negative helicity 
particle. What well, we haven't discussed what you shift. We just shift to momenta. You are right. If we do it for gluons, you have to choose some specific shifts, like which are positive, which are negative, what you shift, such that you avoid that problems of having these poles at infinity. Yeah? For some bad choices, you get poles at infinity. For good choices, you don't. But that's not the main kind of, that's a small detail. But the reason why we need to shift is that we would like to use this Cauchy's formula in this parameter z. So uh, we have to take the residues in z. Yeah? And the residue in z is going on a factorization channel of a shifted amplitude. And we know how it behaves. It factorizes. Yeah? We couldn't use the first line formula because this is unshifted amplitude. On a factorization channel, you are in special kinematics. It makes no sense to sum different terms with different kinematics with special kinematics. The amplitude is for generic kinematics. So as I said, you add one more parameter in a game, and then you lose it. Yeah? You evaluate this parameter on, for different values. And different values would correspond to different factorization channels of the shifted amplitude. Yeah? It's a non-trivial kind of argument. That was also the reason why this was only formulated in 2005, not in 1965, yeah, or 55, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I think for n equals four, for four point functions, you you wasn't uh, you didn't need to to introduce the shifting. Right? You have to do it always. Yeah, you have because four-point amplitude, we did the calculation of the four-point amplitude last time, but it was a little bit cheating in a sense because we kind of upgraded the factorization channel to a full function. But in principle, these are different things. One is factorization channel, S is zero. The other one is the amplitude, S is non-zero. Oh, okay. Everything is non-zero. Yeah, so in order to be able to do it, we have to... We have to use this formula for a shifted amplitude, not this formula for an unshifted. Because we don't know what to do with this unshifted formula. The, res the factorization channel is for a special kinematics. And we would like the amplitude for a generic kinematics. So therefore, we need the shift parameter. Okay, thank you. These uh, spurious poles you mentioned at the end, this is where you added a pole for the contact term, or what are you referring to? No, no, no. The spurious poles will come from the fact that these are on-shell amplitudes. They have physical poles, but only in unshifted kinematics case. Once you shift the kinematics, the physical poles for shifted kinematics become spurious for unshifted. Yeah? So th these guys will have spurious poles. They will be very different from... Uh, they will just not be 1 over p square. Let's say it like that. They will, they will not come from any Feynman diagrams. They will be spurious poles. They will then cancel in the sum. Yeah? So we will see some examples, actually. Unfortunately, the, the first case when these spurious poles show up is for this NMHV amplitude, not for the simplest MHV case. In the simplest MHV case, so that would be also the quick proof of the Park-Taylor formula, there will be only one term in the recursion. Yeah. So there will be no spurious poles, obviously, because of one term. So uh, there cannot happen. But they come from the physical poles of the shifted amplitude. But they become spurious for the unshifted amplitude. Yeah. But they, they will cancel. But uh, yeah, that's the thing which is not manifest here. The gauge invariance is manifest, uh, but not the pole structure. That is not manifest. Yeah, also note that uh, uh, there is actually, a, I don't know if, People took it seriously, but there is a very naive way how to try to construct the amplitude from just factorizations directly. You say, well, the amplitude factorizes on that, so let me just take this amplitude divided by p square, and p is not on shell. Yeah, so uh, just just take the product of sub amplitudes and divide it by p square. In manifestly, for p is on shell gives the right, uh, gives the right uh, factorization channel. And then some overall factorization channels. That's a very reasonable conjecture, but it's completely wrong. Yeah? Because this amplitude has different factorization channels, which you, already which you already summed over. So there is a double counting, multiple counting of things, and you get wrong result. Therefore, this formula doesn't sum over completely all factorization channels, but only over the subset. The others are matched automatically. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's the, uh, 
yeah, I don't know, I don't want to overemphasize it, but going from here to here, it's a huge logical leap. Yeah, this has been known since, I don't know, 50s, 60s, ever. Yeah, beginning of time. And uh, you know this, and you would like to promote it to an amplitude, but how to do it? Yeah, all simple ways don't work. And uh, this is the technical implementation, how to do it, but you have to think about complex shifts. And that's also a problem. Even if you have idea about the shift, you have to shift the momenta proportional to some complex momentum Q. And we are back at the beginning. You have to think about complex momenta, which is there is a block to think about complex momenta for scattering, which is only real momenta. So. No further questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, well, we should make. Uh, 